We decided to train our AI on three base data points, which is the first, the user-generated data, that is the data you feed into the system. The next is the publicly available data, what we can find in the internet about you, because everyone leaves a footprint in the digital world. So, um, and the last is the privately generated data, what our AI does to understand how you interact with our platform, um, who are the kind of founders you like, who are the kind of founders you're thrown into the bin on the platform. So it understands your movements with all this data point. So the beautiful part of it is the next connection is always better than the first. This podcast is sponsored by Go Money. Open a new bank account from your phone in less than three minutes. Right, welcome back to our move back. Uh, this week we have another guest for you, an amazing guest. Uh, but I, before I dive into it, I was just going to let you guys know to like, comment, and subscribe. Dining with us, join the I Move Back community for help and support for business. Uh, London's Home Finder Services. Subscribe to that. Go and get your new property in the UK. They will help you out. But today we have another amazing guest, Mr. Emmanuel. Now he is the a serial entrepreneur. I uh, would ask a serial entrepreneur. Um, an entrepreneur would do. An entrepreneur would do, right? Uh, founder of Help AI, which is connecting co-founders for now, and they will see connect others in the future. Um, he's been involved as a TEDx speaker, uh, kind of seasoned uh, industry expert in content marketing, SEO analysis. So with no further ado, please, Mr. Emmanuel, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit more about you and how you kind of got into Help AI. Wow. Um, thank you so much. It's been amazing. Um, I will say about myself, i um, kind of a go-getter. <laughs> basically seeing a problem and then um, asking myself, can this be changed? Then if the answer is a yes, I go ahead to get it. So I decided to start a venture from nothing. That was a non-profit in 2020. And then um, due to the work, I was able to reach out to 13,000 people and I was invited for a TEDx talk. And I gave the force on how the world can eradicate poverty. But then I saw it wasn't enough, you know. I got to understand it's not about talking, it's about taking the stage and then acting. So I decided to move from activism to doing. And that is how I started my founder's journey. Okay. Yeah. So um, you're moving from activism to doing. And in that moment of time, how did you find that shift? Because I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I kind of relate to that. I used to be uh, in the speaking world and talking a lot of stuff that I didn't really need to do. And then now I'm in the doing world. I actually don't really like the speaking world. If you invite me to things you guys speak, I'm, like, I'm not interested. Because I always feel like the difference between the doers and the speakers. So... As a someone that's now a doer, how do you have you found that transition? Okay, I think I told myself first, I will never say anything which I've not done. Mm. So that was that was the first thing that caught it. So after that, I decided, okay, it first started with the decent work. Basically, how can people come out of poverty? Because I came from that lineage, and then I decided to teach people what I've been through, just like a step procedure. And thousands of people applied. Actually, thirteen thousand. And out of these 13,000 today, these people work with Sterling Bank, GT Bank, Google, JP Morgan, and all. And then I said, oh, um, the impact is not enough. Why? Because it's service-based. Basically, I'm trading my time for the amount of people. And I wanted to impact 1 million people by 2030. And the time was trading. So I decided, oh, let's go to automated platform. And that is where I started learning about startup, basically. 
and learning how to build companies. So I asked myself, how can we automate this? For example, previously we go through boot camps, four weeks, six month boot camps before these people go into this company. But then I said, okay, how can we create a repetitive loop? In the sense, instead of spending six months, six months, in one year, how can we make this repetitive that for this content, you're going to come in and you're going to find it helpful. And that is where I started my first venture. And we moved from there. And now helping like founders build business from the failure of my first venture, I decided to start LPI. And it's been amazing so far. Okay. So talk to me a little bit about Help AI. What, what is Help AI? So LPI is revolutionary. In the sense, um, this is the first of its kind in Africa currently implementing artificial intelligence. Um, other AI startup has been based on GBT, has been based on using um, third-party API, but LPI is building from scratch. So um, what LPI does, um, in the founder's world, it's very difficult to find a co-founder. Sincerely speaking, it is harder to find a co-founder than it is to find a job. It took me five good months to get a co-founder for my previous venture. And then um, I just push it to the, to, to the corner. But then in the startup community where I am a community leader in, I begin to see the startup request. Um, week by week, at least three to 10 founders are looking for co-founders. And we have awesome companies out there currently matching. But if... A problem is being done manually. It means those guys that are out there trying to automate it are missing something. That's right, correct? Mm -hmm. So I started OPI to like automate this. And before even writing a single line of code, um, we all begin to like sell before writing and then we have like pre-sale, enough validation for us to, okay, this is going to work. And we started like building. So LPI basically connects you to someone who has complementary skill, intensive years of experience, quality background, and then passionate about the goal to help you start a venture together. And a venture is just like a long-term relationship. You know, I call startup journey a marriage. Mm, interesting. <laughs> Shall I wait, since you have a question, what are you, what are you thinking of? Yeah, so um, my first question is, why did you decide to use AI to solve this problem? Because right now, if we look at your major competitor, it's like YC co-founder matching score, right? And that literally adopts an organic approach. I think with that one, they send you, um, they have like weekly meetings for your sector. And um, it's not the best, especially within Africa. But I would love to know why did you, of all the things you could have used AI to solve, why did you decide to use it? Um, I know you had your own issues, but to solve um, co-founder matching for that first it's the trend that was the first thing um, but then um, while conducting research on AI um, we decided to train our AI on three base data points which is the first the user generated data that is the data you feed into the system the next is the publicly available data what we can find in the internet about you because everyone leaves a footprint in the digital world. So, um, and the last is a privately generated data. What are AI does to understand how you interact with our platform, um, who are the kind of founders you like, who are the kind of founders you're thrown into the bin on the platform. So it understands your movements with all this data point. So the beautiful part of it is the next connection is always better than the first. Okay. Yeah. So that's why we are using AI. So the AI is trained on that data point, and then you connect with people where you are very passionate about meeting people that are likely able to like connect with you and then fit your scope. Yeah. Interesting. And, and Interesting. how long does it take you to do this? Because with AI, you need a lot of training data. So did you? When when did you know you had enough data that you could actually deploy help AI? Okay, and then this is divided into two phases for us. Um, we call it the version one and the version two. So for the version one, we won't be using AI. We will be gathering data sets. Yeah, 
And that is where we are currently. So basically gathering data sets. And then for the version two, we'll be training the AI to leverage on the gathered data sets on that. And with that, the AI will be very effective as that will be our mode. Okay. Um, what kind of data do you gather at the moment? Um, currently, we, okay, for the version one, we just gather information about you, your startup, um, where you are in your startup journey, um, what you are looking for in a co-founder in time of soft skill, in time of like ad skill, basically, should the person be a videographer, should the person be a software engineer, a good person, a marketer. So those are the data um, we gather. But then in the future, we'll be gathering, um, extensive form of data based on your professional experiences. So we will be looking at where you've worked with in the past, what was your achievement in the past, and then um, what is your LinkedIn presence? Basically, who do you interact with on LinkedIn, on your social media, basically? And then we'll be looking at um, the data points within the system. Okay, which of these founder do you like because um, we have that functionality which do you like dislike and throw into the bin mm -hmm. and how long you spend in a call video virtual or physical meetup with a particular founder so that is how the data set has been trained mm, interesting so go ahead well, and what's the business model how are you earning revenue because you know at the base level i'm thinking if I just found the co-founder, am I really going to stay on your platform after I found the co-founder? So my question number one is, what's the business number uh, model? Number two, <coughs> is it only co-founders? Is there opportunity for us to find, you know, managing um, team members or even employees? Um, I, I think I love that. Um, so for the business model, for the first... For the first three quarters, which is the first year, um, we'll be going through subscription base. And the subscription base is founders are going to pay monthly fee to get much every month. And basically, that the challenge we had with that operating manually was founders do not want to commit to pay three months. Okay, the big question was, why do I pay three months when I can find my co-founder in the first month? Mm. Yeah, and then that's why we are expanding the scope, basically. That you so are the not founder pays for the yeah, service? for the service, yeah. each of these founders. And then in the initial stage, we had around 150 of them. So that's like huge. So then, um, so we'll be expanding like this service just above the founders because once you have a founder, the next thing is to build a strong thing mm. who can build the product. So basically, you can just come on LPI. You can type, I need... A software engineer with five years of experience who has worked with Microsoft and has developed an LNM system in the past. And what the system does, it matches you with that exact profile. Mm. And the truth is, um, no matter who you are, you always want to connect with someone in the professional space. Mm -hmm. So basically, in that scenario, founders can use it to get connected to anybody they wish to. Normal professionals, individuals can connect to anybody they wish to. So if you're looking for a videographer, if you're looking for a managing team, you can just go on the platform and search. And these people will pay repeatedly for this product. Why? Because we've tested it even before writing a single code, and then it works. Okay. So my question is, what is the current way that founders and co-founders meet and uh, kind of establish a relationship? And do you feel like um, your solution would have a, would it replicate that same effect of like the generally kind of meeting of the founder, the rapport you build and that kind of stuff? How does yours kind of replicate something similar? Okay. And um, the social effect for your PI will be um, elements. It will be massive. And currently there are basic four ways which founders meet. The first is physical, just like I'm meeting you today. Yeah. And it can be network of friends, network of enemies. <laughs> yeah, that can be it. Your colleagues at work and all. So basically, you meet them, someone with a complementary skill set, you interact. And if the person decides, oh, let's start a venture together, good and fine. But that can take a while. Why? Because if I want to start a business today, you have to be thinking, who oh, are my friends available? 
Second, you have to pitch to them. And the painful thing is at the point where you are pitching, they might not be ready to start a business. Mm. So that is the first. The second is through um, online um, founders connecting platform, as um, Shalewa mentioned. For example, YC Matching Tool. We have Bubble Bees. We have um, Start Org. We have um, Launch Club, and so much competitor out there. But the major advantage for LPI with us is we have first leverage audience with these early founders. First, second, we are in that shoe. And third, we are using AI to solve this, personalized and not just random. Mm. Um, YC matches you with um, any person, basically. You just tell you just tell the person I'm looking for someone with engineering background. YC do not understand what kind of skill, what kind of frameworks the person should have, and then it just matches you with someone with the name engineer in the mm. profile. It can be a mechanical engineer. Mm. I've been matched with an electrical engineer before while I was looking for a <laughs> software engineer using YC combination, YC um, tool. So like that's really like why um, we are different. And then the last is true events, mm. basically meeting at um, virtual events, physical events, and getting to know each other. And it happens that, okay, you start company together. So those are like the three ways right from my head which founders meet co-founders. Mm, interesting. Shalewa, you wanted to say something? Yeah, so um, in a business like this, you know, they always say data is the new gold. So as you're grabbing this data, you said you're grabbing it from your from your own, um, your information, you're grabbing it from public resources, and you're grabbing it from people's online profiles. Now, what that means is over time, you're going to have access to a lot of insights um, around this space so have you already thought about what you're going to do with this data are you do you ever have plans to sell the data to third parties or is it that new tools are going to come out of the data you're collecting and so for that um security is basically our priority yeah so um right from start we think about scalability basically how do we build globally but first we start locally mm -hmm. yeah and basically, that's why um, right from time, you are using like one of the most secured cloud provider in the internet. So basically, we store our data on the cloud and using um, AWS here. Yeah? And then also, one other thing which we look at is because um, user privacy is very, very important. So we are looking at regulations, basically the US law and then the EU data privacy law. So basically, the use of data um, to what extent can this data be used? And then um, what extent is it like against the law? So those are like what we look at. And then from the data, we'll be doing um, miracle. Let me call that miracle. <laughs> look because, at miracle. <laughs> <laughs> because it's going to be mind blowing um, when it gets to the public. Um, imagine you can through your voice if you're tired and then you can make a voice record. I'm looking for a video a videographer who has filmed with David o in the last five years. Mm. And it connects you with that profile. In case that profile is not available, it gives you the ability to invite that profile into the application. And when that profile joins, you are the first to connect. That is a miracle. Mm. So um, from this data set, um, that is really what we are going to be building. And... Okay, in the case, this won't like shun out physical connection. Why? Because we know physical connection is very, very important. So there is an option to either meet physically because we match people based on proximity. You can decide to match who is close to you, willing to start a company. You can meet over the coffee, over the restaurant to discuss about the industry, the idea, the passion, the goal and all. And if you guys are fit, then you can start a business. You can meet virtually also. Mm. And this is going to be like a game changer in the world. Okay, so let's let's break this down into the kind of fundamental components of, of this program. So when you input um, what kind of learn what kind of language or learning process does it take to understand like what you said to like filter out what the 
subset of data and that um, matches that category. How does that work? Okay. And so for the audio, I will go for the audio and video. For the audio and video, what the tool does, it patches the audio, breaking down into packets, and then translate it into text. Hmm. So basically, where you are saying with voice, you need person A with X number of skill sets who has X number of years. Let me give an example. Let's say um, I need someone in the fintech. I want to be the fintech application. I need someone in the fintech who has developed a fintech application from scratch and the company is currently worth at least $2 million. Now you're going to see that profile and even many more. And how that application works, it breaks down that voice component into text and then it matches the test to that particular person's profile, mm. basically. And the process is very simple. The onboarding is really simple because this data are gotten from user giving very little information. In short, you can set up a profile in just less than 30 seconds. That's the most beautiful part of it. Why? Because, you know, I do growth. And then um, I interface with users a lot. And I really know what the user wants. Yeah. And then um, after this is done, you get connected to the person. In case you change your mind, you can or the algorithm, because there will be scenario where the AI algorithm we are using presents wrong information to you. So once you dislike what the algorithm does, it watches you. Okay. It begins to understand. You just said this. And we give you this exact profile and you are disliking what could be it. And then it suggests another profile, another profile, another profile till you like. Mm-hmm. And the most beautiful part of it is um, you can't communicate with anybody until you both like each other. So it has to be mutually. Okay, it's kind of like a yeah. matching service and yeah. then you have to mutually agree. Yeah. So. So once you both like each other's profile and you see, okay, you, you are coming to me with an idea. It's just like a picture. So the, one of the biggest issues with having a co-founder is kind of like, how do you, how do you g- gain the value? Like how do you measure value? And then also how do you split that value into tangible outcomes, right? So are you guys thinking about that? Because I, w- I, I would like a service where if I did find a co-founder, they, you kind of benchmark their value compared to the product value. I didn't bring any capital involved to the project. And then that can just split out on who gets what share or whatever it is, right? So for that, um, why starting a business um, in the future, which is in our roadmap, um, we'll be having this um, form of interaction, just like generative AI, what ChatGPT does, but just specifically for entrepreneurship and those looking to found businesses. In the sense, what I see in the industry, the reason why there are so many fit startup is because guys who are successful are not imparting their knowledge to those people who are just starting out. So there is that knowledge gap. Hmm. Let me give an example. Um, for example, myself, I find it how to find a co-founder and it took me five months. Now I know how to get a co-founder faster. Now that knowledge gap, because I'm not imparting it to others who are just coming up, anyone finding a co-founder will spend at least that same duration or close to that or even more. Why? Because it will be the same. But then if there is like transfers value, so why no? I'm putting it into help AI, mm-hmm. and we are inserting it into this algorithm called the help AI to teach. So basically, what that works is um, you can ask, okay, how do we split equity? And then it's going to like give you feedback. Let mm-hmm. me give you an exact, some generic feedback. So splitting equity is not based on what you are doing currently, because founding is just like marriage relationship. So you don't split based on what you are doing. You split based on what you are going to do. And that's why it's advisable to split equity equally among founders, except there is a different case. So such feedback, then you can use it to resolve co-founders' conflicts. You can use it to educate yourself about entrepreneurship. You can ask lots of questions, for example, how to get my first 100 users. And then it's going to give you feedback basically from mentors who have done it. So basically, mm. and these mentors won't be interacting with you consistently. They will just share their knowledge one off, and that will be replicated among different cases. Mm-hmm. So you can move towards zero to one thousand to 
early stage to seed stage to growth stage and even to the unicorn. And then what will happen is um, lots of employment opportunity will be created. Um, the society will become better. There will be more job opportunities for everyone. And then the world will become a better place. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Tell me about a little bit about the um, kind of your, your market, right? Uh, have you kind of looked at the market and, and kind of put a number of how many people are actually out there looking for these matching services? I love that question. So during our market research, um, we found out things that are amazing. For example, do you know 60 million new businesses are formed every year? Or in Nigeria? Million, across the globe. Okay. 60 million new businesses. Now, and this 60 million, one time or the other, at least 70% attempt to raise funding. And to raise funding, they were told to get a co-founder. So every every business was told to get a co-founder out of the 60 million? Yeah. Interesting. That's around 70%. So like that is like the data available for the co-founder matching too. So it's basically like a very huge market. But do you always need a co-founder to start a business? You don't need a co-founder. Mm. If you don't have a co-founder, you need resources. Mm. So one will come in place on the other. Because you need resources to hire the right human to start that business. For example, if I don't want to get a co-founder who knows how to, how to code, I might decide to hire the best coders in the globe. For mm. example, push guys from GT, put guys, if I'm building a FinTech, um, push the software engineers at GT, push them at um, Wema Bank, these top banks, and then I snatch them away and I pay them very well. So you know the money must be there. Mm. And the problem with that is this, the startup is a very risky game. So the question is, do you want to spend that much on something you are not sure will work? Or you want to start small, validate till it becomes big, and then you put it all. Because if you put it all in such a risky environment, you can lose it all. But then if you are getting someone which is a co-founder, you are de-risking the opportunity to like lose all your life savings in the startup. Startup is risky. You can lose it all, and then you can gain big. But then um, we decide to risk it because we know, okay, if we get it right, you just have to get it right once in order to like get big in it. Mm. Okay, go ahead, Salewa. So I want to get deeper into um, Emmanuel's thoughts on AI. So obviously the tool he's building, for example, is quite a great tool. It promotes business in a way. It's not directly cannibalizing jobs. In fact, it's even creating jobs. So kudos to Emmanuel for that. However, if you notice over the last um, maybe four to five months, we've seen an absolute wave of fear mongering uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence. This week, um, there was uh, somebody did a study this week and said that 82% unemployment is what he projects for uh, the US in regards to AI in upcoming years. OpenAI also did a study. They analyzed um, every single job and they uh, they basically gave the exposure that the jobs had to AI completely replacing the job. For example, I was a quant analyst in the UK. My job had 100% exposure to AI. And I keep up to date every single day on Product Hunt and on AI Toolkit and so many tools I keep up to date, AI newsletters, different tools. It's allowed me to um, replace myself, you know, hiring people. So, Emmanuel, I really want to know, as somebody who is um, within this space, you know, what do you think about what AI is going to do on a world scale when it comes to jobs and also in the African context? Because I do believe that the effects will happen a lot slower in Africa um, compared to the Western world. So for that... Um... According to layoffs.fyi, over 200 persons has been laid off due to AI. It's very painful. Yeah. But then um, I want us to go far back into um, revolution when the ICT begin to take place in Africa as a whole. Remember during the stage where typewriter was still a thing, where every person was a secretary, 
and the secretary job was one of the top pay then. And then photocopy came in place, if you can remember. And then before you see it, um, those guys who are in typewriter got displaced. But what happened? More jobs were created. Is that correct? I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. more jobs were created during that era. And this is what we happen um, with AI, basically. A um, lot of jobs will be displaced. And the reason will be um, because you can now do those jobs faster, more effective, and then get more accurate output. But then it's going to create far more jobs. And the goal is the population of the world is increasing. And the rate at which job creation is increasing cannot even compete. And what AI will do is going to like fast track this and then ensure like the job meets the standard. Yeah. So one thing I just want to say is... Um, Everyone, even myself, just have to gear up for it, basically. And I still remember then um, what really differentiated those who were secretary and then those who lost their job and those who got promotion was the ability to adapt quickly. The world is changing. We can't be where we are where we are forever you understand um centuries ago are not same with now so basically everyone just needs to adapt you need to learn new skill and that new skill is going to put new pay far higher into the pocket and then it's going to eradicate more poverty even from the economy we've seen this before and then it's happening again and this is what we call like um, um revolution and it comes once in a while yeah. Okay. So I've got a question around just to dive more about that. So, d do you feel like AI will create more jobs than take away more jobs? Let's just understand that's clear. Yes. And what do you think the skill sets going forward in the future, where in, a, in a world like where AI is more dominant, where do you think the skill set that will be most needed would be then to ensure I that those jobs are people are now training themselves if that thing is going to happen? I think um, the first thing will be creativity. Basically, how can you get more in a little time? True prompt. For example, um, before um, chat GBT, you do go on Google, look at around 20 links, read around 5,000 articles to just find a single point. Mm -hmm. But now you can search and you get it direct in one second. So the ability to search, that would be like a very good skill. And then um, no matter the technical skill, because skill changes and then it resolves. But then that ability is going to put you on top of everything. Ability to stay on top of the trend, to be able to like use the tool to get more productive, to do more. For example, you're making videos. Instead of spending so much time making like videos manually, if you can discover how to insert that video and it gives you output in 30 minutes instead of 24 hours, then that will make you more productive. Mm. And what we, that we do is it increases your chances of earning more, it increases your ability to do more, and the last thing, it allows you to spend more time with people. Mm. So let, let's kind of dive into um, finances on, on, on artificial intelligence. So currently, obviously, it's the buzzword. A lot of people are thinking about applying it to different things in their, in their, in their daily world or their business or their work. Um, how can you kind of ensure that people are positioned themselves to kind of gain more financially with AI? Like, what would you kind of advise around that area? Okay, um, for that, I really love to go back to um, the previous Great Recession that happened in 2008. And the most successful companies we know today are the most successful people, billionaires, they were from those times. So I studied then what happened in the Great Recession 28, where they were financial crisis. I mean, it was very difficult. So what really happened is um, people solve real problems. Real problems. So basically, you're looking at what problems are people in Lagos facing. That same problem can be replicated in Abuja, in South Africa, across many cities, across many states. And if you can figure that out and then find a solution, things are going to change around. So we just have to like come back to how things should be done normally. And then you just like, okay, look at the problem, then you solve real problems. And when you do that, definitely um, things are going to turn around, yeah. Shalewa, go ahead. 
Yeah, and, and you know what? It's such a good point. So then on, on that point, to be able to really even know the problems, that's where market research comes in. So mm. you mentioned that you yourself had done market research and you had findings. What is the best tips that you can give to founders when conducting market research in Africa or, or in Nigeria in particular? I think um, the first thing is um, solve the problem you know. Um, before um, searching, making, conducting market research to know, okay, there are 60 billion businesses ac across the globe and something that extensive. The first step is I looked at my community. I looked at what I face personally. Mm. And that is really how it will start. Look at your own problem. What are you facing? Then look at it. Okay, can this problem be replicated across others? Mm. And if you can see that, then you've started. And the major thing is just get data. And if you can't get data, build, let people buy. The best currency is that you are making money. Mm. For example, I come to you and I said, okay, I'm building, I'm building this application, LPI. And LPI has made, let's say, $60,000 mm. in the last three months. And you can put your money, let's say, mm. around um, $10,000 to $50,000 to buy 1% of this company. And in the next one year, this company, in the next four to five years, this company is going to be generating $95 million. Mm. Are you going to put it? Hmm, don't know. <laughs> depends. It depends. Yeah, it depends on like my patience with the money as well. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, if that is the money that you can do without, you will without mm. cost. That's just the truth. Why? Because first, you can say this business is making money. Second, you can see this is in the lips of everybody. Everybody. And people are using it. And if you call user A, user A is saying, this is the best platform. It changed my life. It solved my problem. Same across all users. 40% definitely are going to stake it all. So instead of going down there, trying to find data for two months, three months, if there is no data available, start with what you have, with the... 100 data you can collect, basically 100 real people. Mm. Sell it to them, even before even writing a single code. And if they pay for it, nothing is stopping you, please. That's the idea, Just right? Just go, yeah. Okay. So um, what, what would you say, like, the um, economy is around the kind of your, your AI division? Do you feel like the ecosystem is still a little bit new? Do you think you have that? There's some quality talent available? Um, how do we find those talents? Because, I, I mean, I might have a product idea. I want to kind of hire some people to work on this. And AI, is so it's, it's, it kind of it breaks down in so many different layers. There's like machine learning, neural networks, deep learning, all these different things involved, right? How do people know where to start with like kind of putting together uh, an AI solution? So um, AI has been here since the 19th century. It didn't just come about. I think if my memory served me right, around 1950, 1960, that was how far AI has been. So the major thing is um, there's just recent breakthrough. And you know, one thing is when there is a breakthrough, there is an hype. For example, let me give an example. An example is um, in the future, um, human will be able to age younger. So if that breakthrough come in place, that you're able to age younger and then get old, let's say not as fast as you are doing now, there will be hype around biogenetics. That's correct, right? So same yeah. with AI. So um, since the 19th, they've been what we call the weak AI. Basically, AI that can do just little things. But now, recently, I think 20, 2018, when ChatGPT came, that was when the first of strong AI came into place. AI that can do lots and lots of things. And that's why the future is coming here for mm -hmm. AI to order your food, for machines to be able to do all this. So these things have been around, mm -hmm. but the major thing is it's just like a breakthrough and that's why there is an hype. And for every hype, it's going to like calm down a bit. Let's mm -hmm. give it to Shalewa. Shalewa, go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love this conversation again. Shall I, yes. um, I want to push the dial a bit further. So, 
if you are um, well versed with AI and, and what where the future of the world works, AI and robotics, because we haven't mentioned robotics, robotics will also be a big part of the next decade as well. Um, but anyways, when you um, understand AI and the way um, the big tech companies are taking the world, transhumanism is another topic um, that we'll be discussing a lot more in the future. So I would really want to know <laughs> what Emmanuel thinks about transhumanism because for me I feel like um if you look at technology before back in the day we had those brick phones now we have smartphones that we cannot be without our smartphones we always have them next to us now we have wearable tech so many people are wearing apple watches that let them know when to stand up and go for a walk or that let them know their blood sugar levels and all kind of things the next stage is transhumanism where the technology is actually inside your body so without going into um, too much detail, I just want to know what your thoughts are <laughs> on, on that. <laughs> I think that that's, that's a tricky one um, because I can't predict the future. Yeah, um, we don't know how it's going to be like in years, years to come. But the major thing is um, technology will continue to be an enabler for like human. Help human do things faster, and help women achieve more even in lesser time. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to just, because that transhumanist topic is very important. And you can look at it from a religious perspective. I think there's somewhere in the Bible that says, we shouldn't, <laughs> we shouldn't put chips in the body, right? <laughs> that, that's why I don't but talk then about it, that. <laughs> but then again, you have people like Elon Musk putting chips in brains right now. So, like, it's all too <laughs> different conversation. And, and that's also something that's very, um, very interesting. Okay, let's let's quickly go into trivia. It's a bit of the fun part of the uh, of the of the, the product. And the questions here are really not, not trick questions. Very simple questions. Right? As someone who's very intelligent, I expect you to get all questions correct. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to start with the first one, right? Uh, and the, the question is, who's often called the father of artificial intelligence? Okay, I think I can go with this portfolio. Um, this guy from Google. Yeah, but then I think he's with the name Godfrey, if I'm right. Godfrey? No, that's wrong. I'll give you one more try. God, that's hard. <laughs> you can help me out there. John McCarthy. That's his name, John McCarthy. From Google, right? Uh, I don't know. If he, was he at Google? Yeah. I don't know if he was at Google or was an ex-Google employee. I have yeah. no idea. Well, okay, so question: What is the what is the test called that checks a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human being? So, what is the test called that checks a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to a human being? That's AI. Isn't Eli, because but it's it's uh, an it's named after a man called Alan. Let me give you a clue. Wow! Wow! <laughs> this is making me sound like a dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do you know the answer? Or should I give you the answer? You can give me that. Too. It's called the Turing test. Oh! And if you know Alan, you know Alan, yeah, Turing, you would have known that, that. That that's correct. Yeah. Okay. You've got three more questions to save yourself. Okay, let's try. Right. <laughs> what is the term for the field of AI that focuses on teaching machines to learn from experience and understand the world in terms of hierarchy of concepts? ML, machine learning. Correct, you got that correct. Okay. So you've got two more. <laughs> what is the name of the AI assistant developed by Apple? Siri. That's correct. What is the term for hypothetical situation where AI surpasses human intelligence, potentially leading to rapid advancement or even catastrophic consequences? Can you repeat that? What is the term for the hypothetical situation where AI surpasses human intelligence, Potent potentially leading to rapid advances or even catastrophic consequences? Wow. That's part of strong AI. I know it starts with X. So basically, right. yeah. AI just decided to run wild and just mess up everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what is the name of that term? Oh, God. 
Can you help me there? Singularity. It's interesting. I didn't even know this. But singularity is the answer. So, so that's it. And then to wrap it up, we'll just ask a little bit about what would you do if you were the president of Nigeria concerning your field of interest? Okay, I think um, one thing which I'm going to do is basically create more opportunities. And then, um, you know, Nigeria needs to invest more in infrastructure, basically. And infrastructure is the main thing. And that's why we are not driving innovation forward. So I will invest so much in inf infrastructure that is going to push industries, especially yeah, but that, doesn't, that in AI forward. That doesn't mean anything in terms of like, in, in, in actually like, in the grand industry. What, does, what do you mean by infrastructure? Okay, um, le let me give an example. An example is um, bringing in more funding into the economy, basically making it investor friendly and then um, making regulations, not the one that we eat like AI startups or general startups. So that we help them to like, okay, create more jobs, thrive more and then basically like end more because one thing is um the more successful individuals and companies are in a country the more the, co the country grows hmm. because mm -hmm. basically country lives off taxes and imagine today imagine today if um nigeria is dutiful with tax let's say they are paying as high as the UK, 40%. And then each person is earning 500 k That's more money to the country. So the major thing is investing in those grand works mm. that is going to take people and company out there. And people can't have an increment in salary if the companies are not doing well off. Yeah, mm. that's really the basic truth. So um, that's really what we do. Okay. I like that. Good answers. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Thank you And so good luck much. with Help AI. This podcast is sponsored by GoMoney. Open a new bank account from your phone in less than three minutes.